Every now and again, I get the accusation that the only reason I don't like X, Y, or Z is because I walked in expecting not to like it. And I, I know that's a weird place to start, but I was not expecting to like this game. Like, I'm, I'm not into gore, I'm not into horror, I'm not really all that into, you know, just ripping people apart and psychological death doom, and of course, other things I'm not going to mention for spoiler's sake. So, I walked into this like, yeah, okay, let's let's just do our best, you know. You put on my professional face and do what I can. I liked this game. <laughs> I mean, it has its issues, don't mistake me. But a plus one, plus six score is much better than I was expecting from this one. Anywho, I do want to talk about it a little bit. Like, the core gameplay elements are okay. Would probably get boring after a while. It's something I've talked about a lot lately, especially when it comes to video games, but this also applies to movies and television as well, is you need to use your time properly. I know I've said this before, and I'm going to say this many more times, because I need to hammer this point in until it's absolutely clear for everyone. Because I I see so many people saying, oh, this is too long. It's, nah. Length isn't the problem, it's what you use the length. It, it's, how, it's the density of it, and how you use your time. That's what really matters. I think this game actually uses its time very well. At no point did I feel bored, or even the beginnings of boredom. Like, it was just like, yeah! If it had gone on, say, about four, five, six more hours, I'd probably start feeling the beginnings of boredom. And at about the eight-hour mar mark, I would have probably officially gotten to the point of like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. Because the core combat just isn't that engaging, but it is engaging enough for the duration, right? Well designed, is the point I'm trying to make. You know, the dismembering, uh, the fact that you can stomp on them, the fact that they get stunned temporarily, the fact that you can stasis them, the fact that you can throw stuff at them, you have options. It's not a huge kit, but it is enough of one that, you know, you feel like you're engaged as you're playing through it, or at least I did. Uh, this is also exemplified by the fact that the enemy design is actually quite good. There's a decent variety to the enemies, visually, obviously, but also in terms of how they operate. And oh, I didn't write down their stupid name. It's like the Seekers or something like that were awesome. I love fighting them. It's the guys who, like, hide out and kind of peek around the corner, and they try to bait you out, and they rush around. And just awesome enemy design for those guys. But the other enemies, some of them don't really have weak points in the strictest sense of the word. Some of them, it's really easy to bisect them. Some of them are always going to attack from below. Some of them are, are hard to even see in certain circumstances. There's obvious design elements beyond health or armor or weak points, you know, the, the usual standard for this kind of a thing, that help flesh out the enemy design, which make them actually fun to fight. And they go out of their way to make sure that you fight different enemy types periodically, rather than just like, here's 50 of this guy. It's like they cycle through. A lot of this probably sounds like basic game design, but I think it's praiseworthy, and that's why I wanted to mention it. I also very much enjoyed the fact that you can pretty much pick and choose your weapon loadout. I have been told a lot of people didn't like what I called Old Faithful, which was the Pulse Rifle. The Pulse Rifle became Old Faithful because it was such a utilitarian weapon. It could, it could apply to virtually any, any circumstance, so I had that around like as my default equipped. And you're probably thinking, why, Lore? Well, in a game like this, you're kind of slow. This is not Doom, okay? I can't just immediately switch, immediately switch. I, I don't have that. What instead I have is, okay, hang on, let me switch to this weapon, and okay, let me aim it, and then... There's a nice delay to virtually everything you do, which means you need to be just a little bit more tactical about how you fight, especially if you're starting to run low, low on ammo. Thankfully, that little hologram ammo indicator is nice and obvious at most times. The HUD in general is good in this game. It's not perfect, but it is good. I like the the crisis. I call it the C thing because it's C on the key. I played mouse and keyboard, by the way. This the uh, cryo, excuse me, cryo indicator, which is on the back, and of course your health indicator, which is there, which not only just indicates the amount of health pips you have, but also colorizes to give you a general idea of how your health is doing. Excuse me, I got something stuck in my eye here. That's not a euphemism. I literally had something stuck in my eye. The the little holographic pop-up indicator showing how much ammo you have left. The fact that when you swap weapons, you can see how much ammo you have total. Little things like that were good. The interface wasn't great, but the HUD was good. And I distinguished those two because the interface was actually awful on mouse and keyboard. I don't know if it's better on con console or not, uh, you know, with controller, but pulling up the inventory and the fact that you still had camera control and you're trying to see it because it's literally being projected next to you 
like over here, and so you're like, well, hang on, let me let me swivel the camera this way so, so I can see what's in my inventory. And the fact that you had to do everything, it, it feels like a, a not good PC port. It feels like a game that's made for console. Not really holding that against it, but I, in general, I was not a big fan of the interface. And the controls of the game, again, I don't know if this feels different on controller, it felt like a weird in-between of tank controls and standard sled control, uh, first-person shooter controls. Like, the two just met in the middle, we're like, okay, let's get the worst of both worlds. I kind of got used to it by the end of the game, but at no point did I find controlling the game to be actually fun. And that, and then that was part of the problem. But, ignoring all that, the fact that you... <laughs> this has been a heck of a tangent, hasn't it? Because now we're going right back. You thought I forgot. No, the guns. You can customize the guns and set them up and improve them. I, let, me, let me retract that statement. You can't customize them. You can upgrade them. You can make them better. Now, there's only so many, so you can only upgrade so much. I only upgraded one gun pretty much all the way, and then two guns a little bit, which would be the line gun, the pulse gun, I already talked about that, and uh, whatever the shotgun is, I think it's the force gun. I, I can't remember the name, but it's it's effectively the shotgun. I also carried around the... what was the fourth gun? The fourth gun. It was something I barely ever used, I remember that. Shotgun, line gun, line gun, shotgun... Pulse gun. What the heck was my fourth weapon? Did I have... I might not have... I, th I think I actually didn't carry a fourth weapon. I tried them all out. I went down the list and tried out each of the guns to find out what I liked. The Ripper was amusing, but ultimately more of a close quarters thing. Good for that, though. Good for that. But honestly, I felt the shotgun applied for that. The Pulse was what I used for long range, and if I needed to bisect something quickly, that's what the line gun was for. But that's just my take, and you can upgrade whichever ones you want to play whichever way you want if you really want to focus on just shooting down or you know with straight damage or use the alt fire on a particular cannon it's all up to you i like that i like that i also uh, wanted to talk about the set pieces i don't know what else to call them periodic of the game is just like here have fun with this um at one point you're dangling upside down so you can't move but you can aim just a little bit. You're a little bit slower, and, and, and you're also waving, so your aim is doing this. And you're being attacked by enemies the whole time. That was awesome. Um, at one point, you are racing down a corridor as this giant hunter, brute, whatever, I forget the name, forgive me, is chasing after you. That was awesome. Um, there's, there's several like that uh, throughout the game. I'm not going to list all of them. I actually have a list of them on the actual review page, or at least several of them. It was, it was fun. It, it helped to vary up the combat, vary up the gameplay, put simply, and make it so I didn't get bored, which contributes to that thing. There's also weird puzzles every now and again. The puzzles weren't great, but they felt like decent puzzles. Like, like it's the kind of thing that in, in my review system would be a net neutral, because they're not, they're not, oh yeah, this is amazing, but they're not like, oh, why am I doing this? Just generally enjoyable puzzle design, right? Especially with the pseudo-physics thing and the gravity gun thing. Now, I don't want to praise the game too much. The audio design is actually pretty bad, in my opinion, except for the zero-G sections. Those were awesome. But the audio design had some flaws. Uh, basically, I hate using that word. I'm sorry, I don't mean to do that. I, I, I'm just catching my breath as I'm trying to form the sentence in my head. That's what happens when I say basically, so I apologize. What happens is the, the lows are too low and too quiet, and the highs are way too high. And that's related to another two issues, both of which are audio-related, that really bothered me. The one is the music. Oh, no, not that the music's bad, but how they use the music really didn't work for me in a lot of cases, especially the fact that there's always this ring every single time an enemy spawns. And they do this thing, they, they do the you know, the mosquito thing with the strings in the background. They do that a lot. And I just, I really felt like the music was not applied accurately or well throughout most of the game. I also really don't like the jump scares, of which there are so many. I get that that's kind of the point, but I, I, I've spoken against jump scares many times. I know that jump scares can be used properly. It's really hard for me to come up with an example of that off the top of my head, but I, I'm, I'm sure I could come up with an example. But a game that is chock full of jump scares like this one... Eh, you know, I, I I get the feeling some of my stream viewers were expecting me to go, ah, several times, and I never did, because it, I didn't think any of the jump scares were good. I felt felt like they actually detracted from the thing. 
which I suppose is a good time as any to talk about story. Usually when I do these kind of videos, I like to analyze and discuss things that really caught my eye, but I can't here. The reason why is because we're playing Dead Space 2, and nothing about the greater lore of Dead Space 2 struck me as interesting, except in how it connects to the entire franchise. And I'm not going to sit here and completely spoil Dead Space 1 and 3 in a video about Dead Space 2. So all I'm going to say is that this setting is probably the third or fourth most horrifically horrible setting I have ever seen in fiction, and I mean that without hyperbole. This is a very messed up setting, and I cannot believe, wow, just horrific levels. I'm actually legitimately upset that we're not getting a Dead Space 2 at least any time soon until they decide to revive the franchise, haha, ha, necro necromorph joke, because Dead Space 3 left off in such an obvious, you know, to-be-continued fashion, but because of the fact that there's no Dead Space 4, that's just kind of the end, right? And I'm not going to spoil the end of Dead Space 3, all I'm going to say is that if you think of the ending of Dead Space 3, actually Dead Space 3 Awakening, to be more clear, as the end of the franchise, like that's the end, roll credits, isn't that just kind of appropriate? Anyways. <laughs> um, yum, yum. But I do want to talk about something, so I can't really discuss the lore, but I want to talk about how the story was presented in this one. Let me start by saying I think having Isaac voiced was a good move. I have to admit, I didn't like the misuse of cussing. Some people think I'm anti-cussing, and while well, I prefer not to cuss myself, actually I prefer cussing just be used more carefully and more precisely when it comes to fiction. Usually it's just smeared over the text without any thought for how it's utilized, which can work under the right circumstances, but usually it doesn't, and I feel this is one of those circumstances. I also think that the occasional, oh my god, holy crap, I can't believe it, which was just a regular recurring narrative, as in literally narration that was happening of, oh my god, every time some horrible event would happen, got a little bit old. Those two minor complaints aside, along with the jump scares thing, are my only complaints about the story. There's not much story to discuss just in two, since it so obviously follows from one and so clearly leads into three, it suffers that problem, right, of being the middle of a, of a trilogy, which usually tends to be considered weaker, just because it's only strong because of its connections to the other two. But I'll give the I'll give the game this. When I started out, I was like, "This isn't horror. This doesn't feel like a horror game at all." And obviously, we all have our own definitions of that. And as I discussed during the stream, horror is an umbrella genre. There's just there's just too much that fits under that umbrella. It's like saying something's an RPG, right? How many different, wildly different types of games are there that exist within the RPG genre, the over-genre, as, as I like to call it? Same thing with horror, so I'm willing to let that one go. Because it took me a while to realize what tone the game was going for. Stress. Now, a lot of you are probably going to be like, well, duh, lore, and forgive me for thinking this was a big revelation, but as soon as this clicked with me, I was just like, oh, all of a sudden everything made a lot more sense with regards to the tone, atmosphere, and how the story was being conducted. I suppose it is obvious in hindsight, you know, Isaac wakes up, and he's like, oh, God, and then, he, oh, God, I'm being chased by aliens who are trying to kill me, and... Lore totally doesn't get killed here five times in a row the first time we played it. And then he, I, I get in here and, oh god, there's this guy who's going to kill me, but oh, he has set me free. But then he could commit suicide. Spoilers for the first five minutes of the game. And it's just, and it never really stops after that point, right? And the events of this game happen over the course of like a day at the absolute outside. That tension, that it's, it feels more like a, I almost want to use the word thriller or a suspense kind of a work. But really, I'm going to go back to the original word I started with. Stress. This is Isaac being legitimately stressed to the point of psychosis. Most of us understand and experience stress in our lives, unfortunately. And some of us, and I hope none of you in, in, in comments and in viewer and YouTube, whatever you want to call that right now, have experienced what I like to call real stress. You know, like being run over by a car kind of stress or... You know, there's there's a rabid dog chasing after you. Stra you know, that real stress where it's just, whoa, right? That that kind of absolute uh, spike, right? Now imagine you're going through that spike and it doesn't dip, because that's what Isaac's going through. Oh, there's dips in the narrative. The pacing's actually quite good in this game, and I will give it absolute credits on that one. But the point is, he never really gets to calm down from that point. 
it's just, welp, pretty much all the way up to the ending. The, the, the first ending, not the second ending. And that explains so much of his journey. His, uh, his panic. The fact that he's having so many issues with what's going on and, and has, like, he, he's just on the verge of maintaining some semblance of sanity the entire time, almost entirely because he has an organized mind. This might be me reading too much into it, but he is clearly an engineer, which is something I like, by the way. And as such an engineer, he's, he's constantly f uh, fixing or repurposing or otherwise He's looking at life like it's a problem to be solved. That's that's the mindset of an engineer right there. There's actually two things. He's looking at life as if it should be solved. The other mindset of an engineer is, I should tinker with this until it's broken. But, <clears throat> right? He, he looks at this as a problem. That's how he stays so sane, relatively speaking, throughout the course of this. And I actually would posit the idea he does stay sane. And you're like, but Lore, he talks to his dead girlfriend. He's crazy, not insane. Crazy is, uh, let's use an exact example from the game. Crazy is saying, okay, well, the enemy just knocked off the grav, uh, the grav railways, so we can't get over there. So I'm going to go set up an artificial railway from that ship which is over there, which is filled with hell beasts, in order to make sure that you can actually get over to the station. That's crazy. Insane, to quote my best friend, is when you, you see a box of cardboard in the living room, so you pick it up, you smear some mayonnaise on it, and you carry it upstairs, and you put it there. That's insane. Because insanity makes perfect sense to the person who's insane. Crazy is more a kind of a, ah, I'm going to make this work kind of a mentality, and that is definitely Isaac. Just screw it, I'm just going to pile drive through the next problem that shows up. And it's actually funny that Tideman just keeps making things worse and keeps getting wigged out that we keep pushing. It's like he keeps throwing up. He, he starts off really low, like, I'm going to restrict your access. Oh, okay, well, now I'm going to set up this defenses. Okay, well, now I'm going to remove, turn off the power. Okay, now I'm going to use a solar weapon on you. Okay, now I'm going to send 200 troops after you. And he just keeps escalating because we're just problem-solving our way through his problems, aren't we? Very engineering. But lest I be dismissive, I want to mention one other thing. As much as I'm, you know, Isaac and his problem-solver mentality to push through the stress of, of how he's going through, resulting in crazy Isaac, he also goes through some very, very severe PTSD issues. Now, those of you who know me know that I myself actually do suffer from PTSD uh, twice, if you want to get down to it. And... I, I, I hope most of you don't understand that one too, but when you go, it, when you go through something severely traumatic, there's very little as bad as being reminded of it. And it, you've, you've probably heard the word trigger. I hate to use that word because it's so misapplied, but it, it's, it's like you just see something and then all of a sudden there's just this bullet that slices through you, reminding you of the trauma you went through. Just this. And then it fades, of course, but now you're thinking about it. And it takes, you know, there's, there's exercises and, and, and work that I do, and I'm sure other people have learned their own methods, to not think about it. Just let the bullet pass through, let it hurt, and then get on with it. Right? But that kind of reminder thing, that's just something that reminds you of it, right? Uh, a word, or a picture, or maybe just a scant memory, maybe a smell, you know, whatever. Now imagine that the source of your trauma, whatever it is, we're going to say it's this water bottle. Darn you, water bottle. So there's this water bottle, and this is the source of your trauma. Imagine if all of a sudden it's just reintroduced into your life in the worst possible way. Because that's what happens to Isaac here. He has to go back to the Ishimura from Dead Space 1. And he has to go back through that ship and deal with all that crap. And I'm not sure I could think of something more stressful than that to go through. That's horrifying. And you'll notice that Isaac is substantially less cool about things when he goes there. Up until then, he's just been problem-solving, problem-solving, problem-solving. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. The moment he goes to Ishimura, he starts to actually crack. Credits to the voice actor. And I do think the addition of a voice actor was a good move, by the way. Although, that's mostly because they got a good actor for it. You'll also notice that after that point is when he sounds more unhinged in general, as if he's more willing to actually express the emotions that are burning through him 
as he recovers from it. It's also possible some of this is related to the fact that, you know, the mental memory blockage thing is slowly going away. That is possible, but I'm, I'm not sure. I don't see a lot of evidence of that other than a vague line by someone who's actually lying to us. So it's, it's a great path for Isaac to go through. The idea, and, and frankly, the idea of him laying down his life in, in service of this and getting Ellie out is awesome. And I mean that sincerely. Which makes it even better that he lives and Ellie comes back for him. I don't want to talk about that for just a little bit. I don't have much to say about Ellie other than the fact that she's amazing. I gave her a story plus by herself. Check this out. Uh, at least three times that I can think of off the top of my head. Hang on. One, two, three. Yeah, let's, let's, let's stick with three because the fourth is kind of debatable. There's someone who's like, I'm on your side. I'm here to help you. I got your back. I'm, I'm here to rescue you. Know, they, are, they open the conversation. They, they begin their interactions with Isaac as, I'm your ally, and all three of them betray him, either unintentionally, like Strauss, or we're always planning to, like the other two. Ellie opens up the conversation by trying to shoot us, and then says, piss off, and we're like, no, wait, 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 and she's like, no, 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 don't follow me, don't deal with this, I'm not dealing with this. Okay. Ellie is the only one who is overtly honest with us from word go, and, as a similarly emotionally damaged person, can sympathize and empathize with us, with Isaac, as we're going through the game. Also, the fact that we're both kind of crammed together in, by circumstance, by, by virtue of both being screwed over by Tideman and his the orders he is following. Let's be more clear. I don't want to blame Tideman entirely for this. He actually seems like a pretty decent fellow. In fact, a, a game starring Tideman as the protagonist would probably be pretty legit. Anyways. Ellie's arc and her slow warming up to us and the fact that there's just this bond that is automatically created in that way that only violent circumstances can emulate, right? The idea of, well, we're both screwed, let's do this, does actually make, this, this is a real life thing, does actually make very strong and very powerful connections between the two. And the dynamic between Ellie and Isaac is is pretty good. And most of their conversations are pretty good too. Certainly better than Isaac and <clears throat> Nicole. Yeah. I also really like his bit where he's like, no, I'm going to let you go. You go ahead. You go ahead, I'm going to let you go. And I finally saved someone, and he just... And it's the first time in, I think, the whole game up till that point. He lets himself relax. And this is a great time to segue into <clears throat> Nicole. Spoilers on the off chance you care. It's not Nicole, the woman who died in the previous game. It's the marker. It's the marker he built, apparently. And uh, probably the central consciousness for what would become a you-know-what, if, if I'm understanding the lore correctly. So, <laughs> right after this, he, he excuse me, right before he lets Ellie go, or right before he gets her out and saves her life, uh, the mark, I'm just going to call it the marker, the marker is like, you know, oh my god, you have to let go, and has been approaching him with this very violent vitriol, like, ah, kind of approach this whole time, the uh, opposite of subtle. Then... When he forgives himself and lets go of his guilt, she immediately changes tactics and appears just to be a normal person. And it's beautifully horrific. It's the only subtle thing in the whole game, in my opinion. Not a, not a complaint, mind you. The, the game is not subtle. It's, it, it's like calling Doom subtle. It's, it's not a problem there. But the way that she stops being antagonistic, the way that she starts just quietly manipulating him by showing that by basically continuing to pretend to be an aspect of his psyche, <coughs> excuse me, and by demonstrating how much better things are now, now that now that you understand, now that you're at peace with yourself, now things are okay. You need to make us whole, by the way. And she only mentions that like once. Just, just make us whole. Touch me, Isaac, and make us whole. And he's like, no. He doesn't say no because it would be a horrifically bad idea. He just, he's not there yet. He doesn't understand that she, it, is just using another tactic. I love it. I love the way it just plays him like a fiddle. Until the end, where it's like, hey, okay, so now for the battle in the middle of the mind. And because we have to have a last boss, we have a last boss. Cool. We fight it, and then 
the convergence does not happen. And we did it. We saved the day for a couple of years. This is a surprisingly good game. I didn't talk about the Scientologists, excuse me, the Unitologists, because I don't have much to say there. They are really messed up. <laughs> like, it, it, it's beautiful. I, it, I mentioned that the game isn't very subtle. It's not. But the closest thing that I would say that this game specifically caught to being horror is the, is the Unitologists and the way that they uh, recruit people and the way that they bilk people for money and the way that they try to have people be put into stasis so they can eventually be made into necromorphs and the fact that they're wanting to become part of the convergence and just oh oh god it's all kinds of messed up i didn't talk about the backstory of the setting although we do see a bit of a few hints and tidbits of just how messed up this setting is in general you know the 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 energy crisis that led to the the marker problem to begin with and the massive resource issue the planet cracking which is the only reasonable way to actually keep things going the uh, total negligence for human life just all sorts of you know typical i don't mean typical in a bad way but it, it it's very um it's a very blade runner if you know what i mean uh, i think that's most of what i wanted to talk about this is a good game i hope you enjoy it or enjoyed my discussion about it or enjoyed my stream about it see you next time now, what I was thinking about doing was doing a jump scare here. But the problem is, while that might actually be a good jump scare, that would be really mean of me. So I'm not actually going to do that. Don't worry. <laughs>